welcome to our inaugural very first time lecture series. Uh, this, uh, and I, I know people are still joining in, but we want to start on time. Uh, this grew out of the many conversations I had with my advisory board, who have shown a lot of interest and kindness to want to connect with our students. And I talk to our students who are hungry for interactions with people from the industry. What does it take to go out there? What is my career going to look like? And, and, and how do I see myself? And, and what can I do to, to, to grow? So, uh, and I'm talking to the folks who do the hiring and they tell me that, look, when we hire KU engineers, we, we know we're getting people who are technically competent, but we sort of have three questions to ask them. Can they communicate, can they collaborate, and can they lead? So that has uh, shown us the need to put together whatever we can, a venue to help with that. So that's how the lecture series got started. Again, this is the very first one. So the intent is to sort of teach people the soft skills. Uh, the irony is that people tell me for engineers, soft skills are actually hard. So we didn't want to go with that. And, and professional <laughs> skills, uh, uh, it's been maybe overused. And we've talked about leadership skills and, and people tell me that, look, there are some engineers that are awesome and they love to be in the trenches. They don't want to deal with leadership and they want to do the great engineering work they do. So uh, we, we toyed around with the idea of a name and actually Rich Henderson, who is our distinguished speaker today, he proposed the concept of, of, of career accelerator lecture series. And it really resonated with me because what we want to do is we want you to have great careers as our graduates and we want you to accelerate to your career. You know, you want to hit the ground running, but that, that's sort of velocity. And those of you who remember your physics lessons, if you want to think about your future, it's not about your velocity, it's about your acceleration, if you remember that sort of the trajectory of speed. So, so our goal is to help you sort of achieve that by accelerating your, your, your this. So there are six uh, uh, of these talks coming up this uh, academic year every other Wednesday. Uh, I know personally the six speakers, and I can tell you you're in for a treat. Uh, this is one of the best uses of your one hour that, that you could do. We're going to hold all of those on Zoom. And, and uh, uh, again, Wednesdays at 4 p.m. every other week. I'll, I'll stop there. I'm going to have Bob Parson, Professor Parson from Civil Environmental Architectural Engineering, who has been the driving force behind it, to tell you a little about the logistics of the, how we're going to do this and, and introduce our distinguished speaker, Rich Smith. So, Bob, take it away. All right. Thank you, Arvind. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to have you. We're excited to have you. Uh, and share this speaker series with you. My name, I'm Bob Parsons. I'm a professor in CEAE department. Uh, I'm also, I also serve as director of facilities and special projects for the School of Engineering. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Rich Smith, president and CEO of Henderson Engineers. With more than 30 years of experience in the last 26 at Henderson, Rich has been intimately involved with the growth and success of Henderson at all levels. As chief executive officer, Rich is responsible for setting the company's overall strategic vision and purpose, building the corporate culture, improving internal and external communication, and fostering leadership engagement. Whether it is his special way of turning negatives into positives or his natural ability to incite enthusiasm without even trying, he's been Team Henderson's fearless leader since 2013. What sets him further apart is his ability to connect with people at a level most wouldn't think possible for someone in his position. He can ask pointed questions, listen carefully, and ignite productive conversation, which is just one of many reasons he's had so much success throughout his career. When he's not at, Hen at Henderson, he's spending time with his wife and four kids, maybe playing golf or attending sporting events. He's even been known to throw a little disc golf now and then. He's able to do it all because he knows his priorities. By putting his family, employees, and clients first, he's always doing the right thing for Henderson. And before I completely turn it over to Rich, I just want to say you are invited to ask questions. Uh, we want to hear your questions. And, and the way we're going to do this is you're welcome to chat in the chat box. And I'll be watching those and monitoring those. And uh, at the end, as he's done with his prepared talk, then we'll get to those and, and address those at that time. So we're, we're looking forward to that interaction. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Rich, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. And let it rip. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'm not sure I know that guy, but it really excited to be here. And I was thinking a little bit about my career and when I was younger, what I wanted to be. And I remember when I was younger, I really wanted to be a rock star. And 
just love the music and love the music industry. But there was a couple things that stood in the way of that. And one is I can't sing. I can't read music and I can't play an instrument. So I decided to be an engineer instead. And engineering is probably the complete opposite of what it would be to be a rock musician. But here I am today talking to you. So this is a presentation that we created at Henderson Engineers for a large construction firm in Kansas City. And uh, we've tweaked it over the years. We've probably presented it three or four times. I, it is a little bit geared towards people that are probably mid-career, but we thought it would be a good opportunity for you to be exposed to some things early in your career. And plus, there's leadership opportunities everywhere. You know, whether you're uh, playing on a, a club soccer team or you're working on a project together, uh, it's never too early to be thinking about leadership in the future, and it's never too late to be applying it right now. Uh, if I look over my career, it can be divided kind of into three distinct silos. And the early part of my career, I was really based on the, the technical side of the business. The middle part of my career, I was focused on marketing, business development, and branding. Still had a technical slant to it. And then the last third of my career has been in leadership. So it's been a really interesting lens that I've been able to look over the engineering profession over the course of my, my 30 plus years. So with that, let's jump in. And I would like to start by giving a triple standing ovation. And that's just a word that I made up today. But what that means is that first, I'd like to recognize the School of Engineering for taking the time to creating this certificate and this lecture series. And the, and the Dean said this, the word accelerate was specifically talked about because we wanted to do some things that would help take you beyond just the X's and O's and the technical side. So uh, really appreciate the work that the Dean's done and Bob stepping in and organizing this. Also wanted to give a standing ovation to the advisory board. Um, I'm on a number of different boards and it's pretty easy to go to meetings and listen to what's going on, give some in, input, and then go back to your regular job. And to be given an opportunity to really get our hands dirty and, and help with the mission of the university uh, personally is really exciting to me. And then the last people that I want to give a standing ovation to is the students. And my guess is there is uh, some other things that you'd rather be doing maybe on a Wednesday afternoon than listening to me. But my hope is, is that over the course of the following weeks, you'll be giving some information and perspective on your career that's different than what the university focuses on, which is important, but that's more of the technical side of it and thermodynamics, heat transfer and fluid and those kind of things. So with that, talk just briefly about Henderson Engineers. And Henderson Engineers was founded in 1970. We're headquartered in Lenexa, Kansas. And we are, if, if you only look at firms that do the predominant amount of work in what we do, we're the third largest firm in the United States. Uh, we came close to about 1,000 employees pre-COVID, and we're, right now we're hanging at about 850. And you can see the different locations that we have a presence. I started in 1994. We had about 40 employees, so it's been quite an amazing run over the course of the last 27 years. Uh, but I also want to point out that if a book is ever written about Henderson engineers, there will be a chapter in that book about the impact that the engineering schools in the state of Kansas have had on our company. And KU is a big part of that, but Kansas State has been a big part of that, and so is Wichita State. So we love all of the engineering schools in Kansas and so glad that they passed legislation a few years back to grow the engineering schools. Uh, obviously, I have a little bit of affinity for KU since I went to school there, but uh, those engineering schools have had a really big impact on the growth of our company. This is our company's purpose and vision, and we made a decision in 2015 to be a purpose-driven company, and we feel like uh, some of the other KPIs and project success, uh, profitability and quality all follow by being a purpose-driven company. And the key word in our purpose is the word environments, and that that word has a dual meaning. It is the work environment. We want to have a world-class work environment where our employees can really thrive. But we also want to focus on the environments that we design. And we want to make sure 
that the people that use the buildings that we design can also reach their full potential. And then our vision is to be the firm that changes the industry. And I, I love that vision because it's so aspirational. There are some specific areas that we want to change the industry. So it's not we want to change the whole industry. It's just uh, we want to have that as our, as our vision. So what we do, we like to say that we bring buildings to life. Uh, we're involved in the design and construction of virtually every system that you'll find inside of a building. Uh, we started originally as what's called an MEP firm, which is mechanical electrical plumbing. But over the course of the last 20 years, buildings have become so much more complex and building owners and architects are wanting kind of a more streamlined single point service. So over that time, you can see on the left side just the different services that we've offered and we're, we're way much more than just MEP. And I'll give you an example, security, you know, um, there's been some unfortunate events that have happened in schools, that have happened at movie theaters, that, that has elevated the need for security. And there was a point in time in our history where we had no experience with security. And now it's, it's a, an important part of the portfolio of services that we provide. And then the type of buildings that we design are there on the right side. And it's, it's pretty much any type of building that you'll find out there. You know, one that I'd like to talk about in particular is SoFi Stadium that is opening this fall in LA. It is the home of the Rams and the Chargers. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if they're going to have fans there or not. But I believe that it is the largest, most expensive sports facility that's ever been built in the United States. And it's really cool to think that a bunch of KU grads uh, here in Lenexa, Kansas are involved in that. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about me. And this, um, this presentation is a little bit of my journey, but it's more about some of the lessons that I've learned. And hopefully through those lessons, uh, you'll be able to grow in your career as well. So I was born and raised in Topeka, that is our state capital. And I knew that I was going to be an engineer at a young age because as a uh, class, we went to the top of the capital. There's stairs that wind the cupola and go to the top. But I snuck a paper airplane to the top and I'm such a rule follower, I can't believe that I did that, but I snuck an airplane up because I wanted to see how far it would, it would go. And uh, so I knew at an early age that I was probably gonna be an engineer. My parents were both public school teachers. My dad was the most positive, optimistic guy uh, that you would find. There was never uh, such a thing as a problem. There were just opportunities. And my mom uh, was really outgoing and social, very organized and structured. And as you would expect, I'm a mixture of my parents from Topeka, Kansas. Uh, made the decision to go to KU and um, by the way, I love this picture. This is the final KUMU game played at Allen Fieldhouse. And uh, it's, I've been to hundreds of sporting events in my life, which means I'm old. This is the only sporting event that I can remember that at the end of the game, nobody wanted to leave. Uh, everybody was just so excited. And I think we were down by 20 points and came back and won on the last bucket. Uh, but just no, at the end, nobody wanted to leave. But it was an easy decision for me to go to KU because growing up, um, I loved the, the, the crimson and blue. I loved the Jayhawk. I loved the town of Lawrence. Uh, so I knew at an early age that I wanted to be a Jayhawk. And the engineering school is really a jewel for the university. And I, sometimes I don't think they promote it enough. Uh, but some of the successes that have happened out of the School of Engineering, I was just proud uh, to be a part of that. I finished with a degree in mechanical engineering. It was a counselor um, that at Topeka High School, a counselor that convinced me that I should go into engineering. She said that you've got some decent aptitude in science and math. The world will always need engineers. You should go into engineering. Mechanical engineering was the most broad. And so that was the decision that I made. And my career really made uh, a pivot after my junior year and I had an internship where I was exposed to architectural engineering. And it literally uh, changed my life. And I went from going to school because my parents wanted me to, my, my parents had saved for me to go to school. A lot of my friends were going to school. Uh, it changed that I had a really, just a, a spark of imagination and I wanted to learn. And I just remember a period of time where I just loved getting up in the morning and going to school and wanted to learn as much as I could. And so because of that, I ended up staying and getting my master's degree in architectural engineering. 
Uh, but to this day, at Henderson Engineers, we put a lot of value on our internship program, and a lot of this because of the impact that it had on me personally when I was uh, at KU and a junior. So I wanted to talk briefly about the first couple jobs that I had out of college, and I promise I'm not going to bore you with details, but each one had a common theme, and I want each one of you to be thinking about not my story and what I've done, but some of the things that I, were I was exposed to and how it could have an impact on you. So my first job was with the state of Kansas in Topeka. And I was responsible for doing mechanical, electrical, and plumbing design on projects. And the problem with that was that I only had experience doing mechanical work. And so doing electrical and lighting and plumbing was something I had zero experience in. And, you know, one of the things that I... I, I really took away from that first job was the importance of being respected and mentored and just feeling at home in your career. And this, I chose this image because, uh, you know, that's me needing some help coming up to the top of the mountain and my supervisor and my managers and the leaders of the group really went out of their way to make sure uh, and make me feel good about the, the, the fact that I would chosen to work there and helped me learn and grow in my career for the two years that I was there. The next job that I had, um, I spent six years there and I literally was in the trenches doing mechanical engineering work. And this is really where I earned my street cred in mechanical engineering and how a building goes together. And so I really loved that job. Uh, but the reason that I left that job and the reason that I chose this graphic was because there were times at that job where I was kind of kept at arm's length to the overall process and what was going on uh, in the office and also uh, on, the, on the projects that we were working on. And at times I felt that I was only given enough information to do the job that I was supposed to do. And, uh, you know, that at the end of the day, that affected my ability to grow in my career. Uh, it probably affected my engagement and also how much I felt included in the office. And so that's why uh, I chose this graphic of some people kind of in a group behind and then somebody there in the front. So in 1994, I made the decision to go to Henderson Engineers. And this is an image of some hippies. I actually, I don't think they're hippies. I think they're, they're make-believe wannabe hippies. Uh, and a lot of the people that are probably on the call don't know what a hippie is, but it's uh, a person from the 60s that was kind of uh, just peace and love and, and caring about other people. And uh, the, the founder of our company, Fran Henderson, was indeed a hippie and he was completely out of place in suburban Kansas uh, in the late 1960s and, late, and early 1970s. And so when I started at Henderson Engineers in 1994, I was literally blown away by the culture of the company. And uh, up to that point, it was uh, a tie every day, and it was 8 to 5, and lunch was 12 to 1, and I came to Henderson Engineers, and it was completely different. And there was a tremendous amount of freedom and flexibility, and you were treated as a professional, and you were given a lot of rope uh, in how you were to do your job. And it just absolutely changed the paradigm of what I thought and expected a work environment to be, and it had a huge impact on me. And I think a lot of the companies now have flex time and flex work. And especially with COVID, there's just a lot more flexibility. But for that to happen 27 years ago really made an impact on me. And one of the things that, that stood out to me was my first annual review. And I had been at Henderson for one year and I sat down with the owners of the company and I'd had eight years of experience up to that point. But the questions that they asked me were questions like, you know, what are you passionate about, Rich? What do you love doing? What's going to make you feel uh, valued? And how can we use that to help the company? And, and I'll be honest, up to that point, nobody had ever asked me questions like that. And I didn't have an answer. You know, I'd never really thought about it. I was just used to going into work and doing my job and going home at the end of the day. And the, the fact that somebody cared about me as a person and wanted me to succeed again, really had a big impact on me. And the answer that I ultimately came back with, and it took some time because I had to think about it, was that I wanted to use my technical ability and I wanted to help diversify Henderson and I wanted to help in marketing and business, business development and branding. And so 
it opened up a whole new career path for me using my technical ability plus more of my extroverted personality. And for me personally, things kind of took off at that point in time. We have all of our employees go through Strength Finders, and this is something that um, more than likely a lot of you have gone through um, before, either at KU or in other organizations. And at Henderson, we felt, it kind of ties into what Fran believed in back in the 70s and the importance of the individual. Um, the individual strengths that people have are really important. And we felt like it was a good investment to have. And we have training classes that help people develop their strengths. Uh, but we also felt it'd be a good opportunity for people to be able to get along with and work with others that are different and being able to see. So everybody at our company has their strengths um, outside their cubicle or their office. So you can see right before you go and meet and talk with somebody what their strengths are. Uh, these happen to be my five strengths and they're pretty typical for a person that you would expect in my position. And the one that really uh, stands out and, and really I think makes me unique is the relator strength. And a relator is somebody who um, believes and wants close personal relationships with the people that are around them. And I think having that strength allows me to come across as being sincere and caring and uh, just increases the amount of trust that we have within the organization in, in leadership. This is um, a slide on motivation and literally billions of dollars have been spent on the topic of motivation and thousands of books have been written. And so I'm gonna spend 30 seconds on it, so I'm not gonna do it fair justice, but it is something that I want you all to consider. In classic terms, uh, reward and fear is what commonly we think about in terms of motivation. And it's also been talked about with carrots and sticks. If you want somebody to do something, you give them something, you reward them, or you can put uh, some some fear in them, you know, and this is the stick on the horse. Uh, it could be um, losing your job or being put on probation. But the sweet spot that I found and where we want to operate at our company at Henderson Engineers is that center oval, and that's fulfillment. And that's getting to the point where you get uh, our employees, me included, to do things because they want to do it. They feel like they're part of something bigger than them, and they feel fulfilled by doing it. And uh, I, I think for us, that cultural aspect has been a big driver to our success in bringing in employees and giving them the keys and the opportunity to do some amazing things has taken our company from a small family owned business of 40 people in 1994 to almost a thousand in offices across the country. And a lot of it can be tied back to this slide and motivation and creating an environment where people feel fulfilled. All right, super chicken. So um, I'm sure all of you have heard about TED Talks. And you know, I try to find as much time as possible to watch because they're uh, incredibly motivating. In the summer of 2015, we unveiled our vision and purpose. And about a month after that, I had an employee send me an email. And I'm sure we all get those emails where it's like, man, this is going to take a little bit of time and effort. This is isn't this something I can respond to or delete. And so I set it aside for a couple of months. And it wasn't really until about the holidays when I had some spare time, that I ended up opening up that email. And in this email, an employee in one of our national offices said, I've been watching what we're doing with our vision and purpose in our work environment. And it reminds me a lot of this TED Talk called the Super Chicken TED Talk. And the Super Chicken TED Talk was a talk by Margaret Heffernan that has about 3.5 million views. And what they did in this study is they took two groups of chickens. One group of chickens was uh, a normal operating community of chickens, and they let them work and get to know each other and, and live together. The other group of chickens were more in a competitive situation. And what they would do is they would continually take the chickens that didn't produce enough and um, add more competitive chickens into that community. And then they compared the production of eggs between these two groups. And what they found out, and it wasn't even close, was that the community of chickens, the chickens that learned to get to know each other and work together in unison and live together, easily outperformed the group of super chickens. And the super chick, I think the the TED Talk author says that the super chickens eventually pecked themselves to death because 
it was all about competition and creating a star performer. Um, so what, what are the, some of the takeaways for me as far as being a leader? Create an environment where your employees can get to know each other. And Margaret talks about in this TED Talk, a company that put their coffee in one single location and it forced their employees to interact and get to know each other on a level beyond they would have done just working on projects together. But create a culture of help, helpfulness, create an environment where everybody is important and diversity of thought and diversity of backgrounds is important. But another one is a culture of trust and safety. And I think this is something that's really important. And I wanted to talk about a, a KU basketball example. This goes back quite a few years to a different coach, but there was a very uh, highly rated basketball player that transferred to KU. And this player wasn't getting a lot of playing time, but during the middle of a game, the coach put him into the game. And it was an out of bounds play right in front of the KU bench. The other team, threw the ball in and this player fouled the other team and the, the ball the whistle blew and the ball stopped and literally one or two seconds went off the clock and the coach pulled this player out and put him on the bench. And I remember watching on national TV, what kind of message that sent to the team, what kind of message that sent to the player. And believe me, I'm in no position to be critical of the coaches that have been at KU because they, uh, they know more about basketball in their pinky than I do in all of me. But, I, but when I saw that, I, th I, I thought about the player and, and what he went through his mind. He knew that he couldn't make a mistake or he was going to get yanked out of the game. And so naturally, I went to our work environment. And we want to create a safe environment where, you know, certainly we don't want people making a bunch of mistakes on our projects. But there is the ability to make mistakes and be coached up by that and you're not going to get be, be fearful of losing your job through that uh, would highly recommend if you have 10 minutes to watch that super chicken ted talk and i do want to read one uh, quote out of that super chicken and it's a new definition of leadership leadership is not a talent competition where some heroic leader solves complex problems by themselves leadership is about creating an environment where people can do their most courageous thinking and more than anything, that's one of the most important things that I will talk to you about today is, is creating that environment um, in, in your work. So leadership, let's talk about leadership. I'm going to talk through 14 different concepts that I've encountered during my career. And these are things that I would like for you to think about, again, not in terms about my story and what I'm telling you, but how it can apply to you and the, the things that you're experiencing, not only today, but in the future. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'm going to give you my five keys to success in life. And the fifth one, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but the fifth one is creating a brand for yourself. You know, what do you stand for? What are your goals? What differentiates you from others? And life is a journey of you experiencing things, witnessing things, and using that data and that information to continually improve yourself to be a better person and uh, creating a brand and kind of a definition of what you stand for, um, I found is something that really can differenti differentiate you in your career. So we're gonna go quick, but these are 14 different things that uh, I've encountered in, in my leadership journey from being an entry level engineer to the president and CEO of a company. Uh, the first is the old saying that it's lonely at the top. And when I first graduated from KU and I was in my first job, my dad took me to lunch and uh, he had gotten to the point where he was a man, he was a principal at a school. And uh, he told me that it can be really difficult to be the manager or the leader during the day, but be one of the guys or being one of the girls um, at the end of the day. And this is something that in leadership, that is just a big challenge. And people are watching you. People are watching what you say and watching what you do. And sometimes it can feel really lonely. And, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do in my career is find peers that I can share with, that I can vent with, because uh, you certainly don't want to go out to the rank and file and, and tell everybody about what a crummy day it's been or a problem or whatnot. Uh, and I was trying to think of an example that, that students could relate to, and the best one that I could come up with, it was an RA in a dorm. And an RA in a dorm is a leader, and they're responsible for leading that floor. Um, 
I'm sure there's days when they see some things that, that freshmen are doing that they, they can't believe. Um, and and they, have, they probably have good days. And, you know, they want to be friends with the students that are on that floor, but they're ultimately responsible for managing and leading that floor. And my guess is when they are having a bad day, those RAs probably get together and they use that opportunity to be able uh, to vent. Next topic is, what do you do when somebody does something different than how you would do it? And this is one of the biggest struggles that I've seen engineers uh, deal with in their careers, because as you progress in your career, somebody's going to be doing your job that you were doing before. And the challenge or the struggle is, and believe me, there's, there's many, many ways to skin a cat, and it doesn't have to be the way that you want it done. Um, but are you going to um, be frustrated by the fact that somebody's doing it different than you would have done it? Or is this an opportunity to celebrate and empower people to be able to do things in a way that's maybe unique to their skill set? And a really good example for me was uh, I was the owner and principal in charge of the marketing department for about 15 years. And when I was promoted to president and CEO, I no longer had the time to be involved uh, and oversee that department. So we hired fantastic qualified people to take that department over. And the challenge for me was, was I going to question? Was I going to meddle? Was I going to get involved? And um, to uh, a fairly good degree, I've stayed out of the marketing department and let them do what they do. And what's happened is that the marketing department has elevated itself and it's so much more powerful, influential, and doing such a great job compared to when it was um, when I was in charge. And I think that's a sign of a good leader, being willing to empower people and let them be successful and maybe even more successful than you were. Um, the notion of boss versus leader, and this is something that was introduced to Henderson uh, by a speaker several years ago. And I think a lot of times when you watch TV, you watch The Office, uh, or maybe even some of the older TV shows, the notion of this alpha leader that pounds on a table that has all the answers and, uh, you know, is kind of larger than life. That's kind of what we're, we're taught, um, you know, kind of growing up watching Hollywood. But the reality is the most successful leaders are the ones that uh, understand, have soft skills, can, uh, you know, be empathetic, are vulnerable, and work together as a team and are willing to get their hands dirty and work side by side with people. Uh, this was a huge turning point in my career when I realized that I didn't have to be this pound on the table larger than life boss. And I could just kind of going back to the um, super chicken, I could focus on helping people reach their potential and their goals. Uh, the problem of ego. And all of us have ego. And sometimes when you're put in a position of leadership that, that can go to your head um, you know, one of the things that I continually remind myself that it's, it's a team sport and a group effort, and I was put in a position of leadership, not just by the efforts of me, but the efforts of others. And um, a lot of times I will use the mirror as something that keeps me honest. And when I'm making decisions, I want to make sure that those decisions are for the best of our employees and for our company. And if I can look at the mirror in the evening or in the morning, and tell myself that uh, I'm not uh, letting ego get in the way and I'm making decisions for the best of others that I can move myself forward. Ah, rowboat mentality. And this is kind of a cousin to ego. And the problem here is a company or a leader or really a person that is focused on their past and their past successes and not looking ahead to where the industry is going or where the company is going. And there's a, a laundry list of companies that are out there. Um, Kodak comes to mind, Kmart. Kmart used to be the major retailer in the United States. I'm not even sure if they have stores anymore. Uh, Western Auto, Starter. You probably remember Starter Jackets. Maybe you're not young or old enough to remember Starter Jackets, but Starter Jackets used to be a big deal and very popular. I'm not even sure they exist anymore. But the notion here is that you can't rest on your laurels. You have to remain relevant. You have to keep looking out in front of the direction of where your company is going. 
and make decisions to help guide the direction and, and not be complacent. And in my life, in my career at Henderson Engineers, I've seen hand drafting go to AutoCAD, to go to Revit, to even go to now the integration of design and construction where it's happening simultaneously at the same time. So again, be looking forward. How do you act when things aren't going well? And this is something that when I'm reviewing employees, uh, pretty much at any level in our company, it's something that I look for. It's easy to be a good leader when things are going good. If, if the company's growing, you're landing projects, culture's great, you're profitable, it's pretty easy to be a leader. But how do you act when things aren't going well? Um, you know, COVID has been an excellent opportunity for leadership to kind of rise to the top. And it's been really amazing a watch uh, across the, the country where leaders have stepped up. And one of the things that I've learned is uh, have a plan, communicate that plan. And when the going gets tough, you don't want to get upset or mad. You almost want to dig into an even lower gear and show that confidence and show that level headedness that we all want to see in our leaders. This is a new slide that I added because I think it's, it's really, it was a, a big paradigm switch for me in my career. And it has to do with delegation and the ability to multiply and really raise up people. And the, the lack of delegation looks like three things to me. The first is I don't want to ask or bother people to do it because I don't want them to think that, that you know, I'm more important than them. That's one way it can look. Another is I can do it better than somebody else. So why waste my time and let somebody else do it when I know I can do it better? And the other one, the last one is, uh, it'll just take too much time to train somebody or explain how to do it. And so all three of those pitfalls can prevent us to delegate. But again, I, I said that I had a huge paradigm switch in my career. And that is by allowing people to do some of the tasks that you do, you're actually allowing them to grow in their career and empowering them to grow in their career and make them feel good about themselves. But here's, here's where it really hits home. By delegating, it allows you then to have time to be able to focus on things where your strengths are and really help drive the company or the project or the classwork that you're doing, allows you to have more time to do the things that can really have a bigger impact on the company. And one of the things for me personally is that I've struggled with is expense reports and I never wanted to ask anybody to do expense reports for me because it, I felt like they would have been beneath me. And so what would happen is that my expense reports would pile up on the floor in my office right behind me. I have an executive admin uh, that we hired and lo and behold, she's a taskmaster. She's super organized and she loves getting things like that done. And so by delegating that to her, uh, she gets to flex her strength and also feel good about herself because she feels like she's contributing to my success and also to the success of the company. Okay, this one is probably the biggest thing that I struggled with in my career as I went into leadership, and that is you can't make everybody happy. You can make the most researched best decision ever, and it's proven that it was an awesome decision. You are always going to have detractors no matter what. And I think there's a DNA in all of us that we want to be well liked and we want to be successful and, and be happy. Uh, and so it can be a challenge, right? And, but the reality is, if you are going to go down a path of leadership, you have to be willing to make tough decisions. And oftentimes those tough decisions have to do with people's career and their livelihood. But at the end, almost every time those tough decisions work out uh, for the best of the company. Okay, this notion of public versus private. Um, when there are problems within the walls of Henderson Engineers, um, whether I was intimately involved or not very involved at all, I take complete ownership and I use the word I. If there's something that's fantastic going on at Henderson and there's something successful, I use the word we, or even better, I'll use the specific people, people's names that were involved in that. And when I was first named president and CEO, uh, I made a decision about one of our top clients and it was a group, it was a group decision and there's a lot of people that gave input in this decision, but ultimately it ended up being a bad decision and we lost some work and we lost that client. After that happened, uh, from every day forward, 
I took complete ownership of that, that it was I, and I made the decision, I made that decision and, and it rested on me because it, as being a leader, the buck has to stop with you. Um, a quote that I love that we use in our leadership team quite a bit is this quote, fight like hell for what you believe in when the door is closed and then support like hell the decision once you leave that room. And what I mean by that is when you're in private and you're talking about an issue or a project, uh, you can disagree and you can challenge and that that conflict is healthy and good. But once you leave that room and you go out into the public realm, you have to support each other. You have to support that leadership team and you have to be behind yourself. And the worst possible thing uh, for the health of a company is to have the meeting after the meeting. And that's uh, the first meeting is the meeting where you make a decision. And the second meeting is where people get together to complain about why we made that decision. But this whole notion of public and private and uh, treating people with respect in public is something that's very important. Never eat alone. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that mealtime can be kind of a magical time to break bread and really get to know other people. And, you know, going back to one of my strengths as being a relator, I use mealtime um, to really connect with people. And that's my peers with employees and also with clients um, in the industry. And uh, I have a breakfast. I don't right now with COVID, it's a little bit different. But prior to COVID, I had a breakfast almost every morning and I uh, became really good at ordering oatmeal because if I had bacon and eggs every day, I would weigh, you know, 700 pounds. But don't underestimate the power of spending time with people over meal. And it could be breakfast, it can be lunch, it can be dinner, it can even be a happy hour. There is an exception to that. And um, you know, some of us are introverts and we do need some downtime. And so sometimes we need to balance that and the meal time is a great opportunity for a leader to kind of decompress and to get that energy level back. But in general, use that meal time as an opportunity to connect with people. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a fantastic book that was written by Patrick Lencioni. And you know, one of the things that we talk about on our leadership team is this notion of continuous learning. And we're always pushing ourselves uh, to learn, uh, to challenge. And uh, we have an annual retreat and we have a, a book that we read and then we come together and we go through activities and try to challenge ourselves. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team was one of the best books that we re read together as a leadership team. And the five dysfunctions are trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and inattention to results. And I talked about this on the previous slide. Trust and conflict are very important and also being vulnerable to each other. But um, what you don't want is a group of people that everybody agrees. You want to have that challenging and that conflict. And you want to be able to move your leadership team forward in, in, the, in the world. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, looks like we, hopefully we have some questions. Um, okay, uh, people don't leave companies, they leave their managers. And this scares me a little bit because you could have the most fantastic company in the world with great culture, benefits, fantastic opportunities and projects. But if your uh, managers within the company are failing, uh, you're going to have turnover and people to, to leave. So uh, oftentimes what happens in engineering companies is that people are good on projects and because they're good on projects, they're automatically promoted into more people facing roles. And sometimes that can be a challenge. I think it's called the, the Peter principle where people rise to the level of their incompetence. Um, but you need to make sure that people have the skill set and the training and the ability to move from being a technical person working on projects, moving to leading and managing people. Super, super important slide. And that is, uh, I see a question about those. I'm going to get to that at the end. I've got my five keys to success. I will get to those. Um, culture wins championships or described a different way. Culture eats strategy for breakfast and strategy is critical. Every company, every organization, um, University of Kansas, you have to have a strategy of where you want to take your organization. But if you don't have the right culture to be able to act on that, you're going to lose every time. And uh, 
this was, um, I'm, I'm going to cut some of what I want to say, but one, of, I, I am a big KU football fan and I'm in a minority. Uh, and I, I've always felt like KU basketball has been plenty successful on its own. It doesn't need me, but I've just always loved falls on Saturday in Lawrence, Kansas, and I've always loved college football. And one of the things that I've noticed that Les Miles is trying to do, he's trying to win a winning culture. And I know he's trying to, to build the team with quality people, but one of the things that I notice when a high school um, football player commits to KU, you almost always see this. They'll say in their comments, I loved the culture or I love the family environment. And believe me, you've still got to be able to throw the football or run it and stop people. But culture wins championships. And I really like what Les Miles is doing with the culture with KU football. Public speaking. Uh, there was a study done years ago that people actually fear dying more than public speaking. And that just blows me away that people uh, fear public speaking more than, than uh, dying. But if you're in leadership, there's going to be an opportunity for you to get up and talk about uh, the direction of the company, the, the goals that you have, and just be able to influence and inspire people. And there's probably, uh, for me personally, there's probably 12 opportunities a year um, where I've got to get up in front of large groups, but on a weekly basis in smaller groups, I'm continually getting up and communicating and trying to lead people. And that's, that's just part of being a leader. Um, me personally, and it's a little hard to do this on Zoom when I'm talking to an iPad, but I, I tend to, I always, I always have notes. Uh, I don't read from my notes and I tend to think about uh, pictures and stories and thoughts. And uh, if you think about it, uh, think about one of the best days you've ever had in your life. Um, you know, winning a state championship or, um, you know, marching in the, in, the, in the band and winning the title for best marching band. You don't need anybody to write down what that day was like. You know, right? You lived and breathed it. So I tend to like to talk in snippets of thoughts and pictures and images. And I tend to be overprepared to allow me to improvise. And that way, if things go in a different direction or it goes off track a little bit, I can kind of uh, move along with it because I'm, I'm overprepared. We did have one of our owners that is uh, ex extremely fearful of public speaking. And we had a company meeting about a year ago and I went to this owner and I said, I need you to, to, to talk for just a brief amount in our next company meeting. And as expected, he said, hey, I'm gonna be out of town or I can't make it. And I said, no, you need to be here. And we carved out a small role for him and he hit it out of the park and, and really helped convey the message. But what was really cool, and this ties into our purpose as a company, to see the pride and the satisfaction of this person accomplishing something that they didn't think they could do was just really rewarding uh, for me to see that happen. This is a, a list of really superhuman leadership traits that we came up with at a retreat several years ago, and I'm not gonna go through each one of these, uh, but there's one that I wanna pick out, and that is confident. It's down on the lower left. And you know, one of the things that I've learned, there's a saying that uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's something that uh, in leadership that I've encountered all the time. And uh, I've learned to be confident in situations where I'm not sure how it's gonna end up. And I think that's just a trait of, of leadership is being able to, you're not sure how it's gonna go, but you're just confident it's gonna work out. And one of the great, greatest examples of this, of, of the value of confidence was the 19, I believe it was the 1962 televised presidential elections. And this was a debate, and it was the very first public debate that was on TV, and it was between uh, John F. Kennedy and Nixon. And they both took two completely different approaches to the debate. And uh, I think Nixon was actually under the weather and he refused to put any makeup on. And Kennedy had makeup on, he came across as very confident. and. Uh, the day after that debate, the, the polls switched and so many people uh, switched their allegiance to and their support to John F. Kennedy because of, of the, how he came across as a confident leader in that specific uh, incident. One more thing I want to say about this real quick. 
and that is being a consensus builder. Yeah, it's on the top right. Um, a leader, uh, you don't want to make all the decisions yourself. And I, what I like to do is divide decisions into A, B, and C decisions. And the A decisions are the big, important decisions. And those are the ones as a leader you need to, to make yourself. A lot of times those have to do with personnel decisions and letting people go. Uh, the B decisions, I like those to be the medium decisions. And I really like to get, uh, get input from a wide variety of people. And then you kind of make a group decision. The right decision kind of comes out of that. And then the last type of decision is a C decision. And those I like to delegate. And I love to empower people and give people the opportunity to feel like they're in control and helping run the company. So uh, A, B, and C decisions uh, help with me being a consensus builder. So a tipping point for me as far as leadership came when I realized the fact that you don't have to be this problem-solving superhero and that an empathetic leader that um, helps people reach their goals and their potential is really what makes um, um, leadership successful. And I never had a goal to be the president and CEO. It wasn't that I sat down when I first started and said, man, that's what I want to be. And I think for me personally, it makes it even more rewarding and fulfilling that I knew that I focused on the job ahead of me. And over time, I was able to get to that point because of how much I cared about others and about the company. Okay, I'm going to finish with a couple quotes. Uh, this started early in my career. I started to be a collector of quotes. And right now, I probably have a 100 of them on note cards in my car. And I read one every morning. And when my kids were young, I have four kids and three of them are college age right now. But when my kids were younger, I would read a quote with them on our, when I would take them to school and they, I'd get the eye roll about it every once in a while. But it was really cool to read the quote and then talk about what that quote really means. So I've got, I think I've got four or five here that I'm going to finish with. Uh, the first quote is the only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. And we've talked about a lot of kind of soft uh, skill things, but at the end of the day, to be successful in engineering and to be successful in leadership, it takes a lot of hard work. And a lot of times you'll see the leader being the first one in in the morning and the last one to leave and just rolling up your sleeves and uh, you know, getting involved can go a long way in your ability to be a leader. Attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? You know, nobody wants to work for somebody uh, that has a bad attitude and everything in an organization starts at the top. And uh, Roy Williams was the coach at KU when I was um, there, the basketball coach. And he said when he's recruiting somebody, he certainly they have to be a good basketball player and they watch what they do on the court. But they'll also watch what they do when they go to the drinking fountain and what they do when they interact with parents and with the young fan. They want those kids with a positive attitude that are in it for the good of everybody. This is a great quote. A star wants to see himself rise to the top and a leader wants to see those around her rise to the top. And um, this pretty much defines my leadership journey in one quote. And one of my favorite examples of this, I feel like I'm going back to KU basketball. I'm sorry about that. But there was a great player in the 60s, and his name was Jojo White. And uh, Jojo White was an All-American at KU. Uh, took us one step away from the Final Four, but he went on to play for the Celtics. He was an MVP and an All-Star there, and his jersey is hanging in the garden there in Boston. His coach at the time, uh, when he was at KU, was Ted Owens. And Ted Owens said, Jojo White's best game that he ever saw him play, he only scored three points. And the reason that it was his best game, because he elevated the play of everybody else and allowed them to play at a high level and to win. And so that example in this quote is, I think, really important. Man, this is another really, really, really good quote. Under poor leadership, we feel like we work for the company. With, with great leadership, we feel like we work for each other. This is like the holy grail of corporate culture. And this is something that we've been able to bottle at Henderson Engineers. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to feel like they have to do something or they work for somebody else. If you feel like you're a part of something bigger than you, you feel like you're a part of an organization that has a purpose and wants to make a difference, 
uh, some of the stress uh, that goes along with work kind of goes away. And this has just been really powerful with Henderson. And this is the last quote that uh, I'm going to mention. And I love this quote so much that if you uh, find me on Facebook, I've got it on my, on my, my front page there. And what I like about it is that it takes us beyond titles. It takes us beyond money. It begins to you know, define your legacy as a leader and what that could mean. And I think it all gives us a sense of purpose. And I've weaved in a lot of stories throughout this presentation about how bringing out the best in others will help you. And uh, Zig Ziglar was a fantastic motivational speaker in the 80s and 90s. And his version of the golden rule, uh, we all know the golden rule, do unto others as you'd like to be done to yourself. But his spin on the golden rule was, you can have anything you want in life as long as you help enough other people get what they want in life. And uh, this is something that is very important to me in helping others. And through that, you're going to help yourself and your company get to where you want. Okay, so we are at five o'clock and I did want to mention my, my five keys to success. And then uh, if we have time for some questions, we will do that. Um, and my relators, this is really difficult for me because my relator skill, I, I want to connect with people and I want to help people. And talking to an iPad, it's kind of hard to do that, but um, hopefully you've gotten some value out of this. So my five keys to success. Uh, number one is work hard. And it doesn't matter to me whether you're at the front desk being a receptionist or you're empty and trash or you're the president and CEO. Uh, work hard and be an achiever in everything that you do. The second, and I talked about this several times, and that is have a positive attitude and be passionate. And uh, having a smile on your face, a fire in the belly, and a pep in your step will go a long way. And my, my, I talk about this with my kids so much. Uh, I just think it's really, really important. The third is putting others first. And uh, you can still see that quote that's up there. That's what that's all about. It's servant leadership. And it's wanting to help others and putting others first and the value in that. The fourth is do the right thing. And another way to say it is make your parents proud. There's kind of two ways that you can look at that. Um, as you uh, literally, as you, as you leave this Zoom today, and as you graduate and you start your career, you're going to be faced with a lot of different decisions. And some of them are going to be pretty straightforward. Some of them are going to be ethical decisions. Um, do the right thing. There's, you will never be led astray by doing the right thing and use that mirror to help uh, guide you in your decision-making process. And then number five is to create your own personal brand. And I talked about this earlier. What do you stand for? What are your goals? What differentiates you? What have you used in your life to create who you are and how is that going to help you uh, accelerate your career? So work hard, positive attitude, put others first, do the right thing, and what is it that's special and unique? What is your strength that, that you can um, help promote yourself? So with that, Bob. All right. Thank you, Rich. That was great. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in. And so these are really in, in I would say, three categories. We have uh, sort of how do I get started questions? We have some general questions about leadership, uh, how to improve leadership skills, and some questions about specific, specific uh, challenges that might arise. So we'll start off with what I think is probably the most common, commonly conceived of question amongst students. Uh, and the first question that came in, so what majors do you hire and do you hire computer science students? And is it worth it for non archie students to apply? We hire all, all types of, of people. We have accountants. We have computer science people. Um, if, if I was going to be spoiled rotten, I would hire architectural engineers. Uh, but the reality is my undergraduate degree is mechanical engineers. Uh, we have nuclear engineers. We have civil engineers on staff. So we hire a wide variety of people, not just architectural engineers. Okay, great. Uh, kind of following on to that same idea, uh, 
Do you have internships? And if yes, what is the earliest year you would accept them? And I would ask, are there, are there certain preparatory skills that an intern should, should have? Um, so we have a, a very strong and vibrant intern program. And I talked about my personal experience with an internship and how it had an impact on my career. We probably average uh, 30 to 40. Um, probably, you know, the, if, if you're going to be in a technical career at Henderson Engineer, I think our expectation and what's going to set you apart is if you have AutoCAD and or Revit experience. Uh, but beyond that, we're going to train you and, and help you. And we have, uh, we have an amazing intern program where um, they, they do events together, they network, they do projects together, they even plan a party at the end of the year. So gone are the days where you're sitting in a corner or going getting coffee for somebody you will be involved in projects that are going out the door and being built. Uh, but we have a vibrant and exciting intern program, uh, probably, you know, minimum sophomore, but probably junior would, would be ideal. And you really need to know AutoCAD and Revit if you're going to be on the design side of what we do. Okay. How, um, what is your approach to handling a crisis situation? For example, how did you handle or are you handling the pandemic? And I would just add, since we're talking about the pandemic, how has the pandemic changed your work product and changed the way you work? And are those changes permanent? <laughs> that, there's like five questions. In I'm there, sorry. Man. Yeah, maybe we, maybe we lump to it. Let's start with crisis situation. How, what is your approach to handling a crisis situation? Um, so really, really lean on your leadership team. That's really important. Uh, have a plan, come up with a plan, have everybody buy in. And then the key part is communicating that plan to the company and over communicate it. It is so easy being an engineer to research and come up with a decision and then do it. The hard part is communicating it and you've got to communicate. It is so important and it's hard for me. Uh, you know, you think you've done your homework, you've got it done and here it is, but then People, your, your employees aren't in the room. They're not there. They're not aware of the decisions that you made. Uh, and just being able to, to communicate that is really important. How it's changed. So I, I'm stunned, absolutely stunned that we have not missed a beat. Um, it was a Tuesday afternoon. I sent an email to our uh, employees that we were going to go remote. And literally pick, people picked up their monitors, their laptops, and they walked out the door. And it was kind of a oh shit moment, like what you know, what's going to happen, right? Um, but people elevate, right? You know, our leaders, our employees, they all stepped up, and I'm not aware of any situations where we've missed a deadline, we failed a client, and it's just amazing to me. And uh, I'm, I'm an older person; I've been around a while. I, there's incredible value to face to face connectedness, um, camaraderie, teamwork. But I think this crisis has proven that there could be a new and exciting way to design the, our work environments in the future that take advantage of that ability to train and mentor and grow and develop employees, but also give employees the freedom and flexibility to design their work environment that's best suited for them as an individual person. So it's been, it's been uh, initially a challenge, but I think at the end of the day, it's really, it's going to be exciting. For, for Henderson engineers and for our industry. Is it gonna change what your clients are looking for? If you're building an office building or, or something? Is, is uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I, think, I, I think that, I think that uh, office buildings will always be needed, but our, our spin on it is that our footprints are going to shrink some, right? Uh, there's no reason to have all the square footage and all the space and amenities if there aren't going to be people here to use them. So let's shrink that space down. That will help us from a business case on the bottom line. And by shrinking it down, you'll still have some of the energy um, that, that you have when people come together. And, and one of the things that I worry about since I'm talking to, to college kids is what does that work environment look for you? And, you know, i I would, I would be fearful of starting a new job and working in my apartment, right? And not having the ability to be mentored or trained or working side by side with somebody with experience. 
And, uh, you know, everybody's different. And, and I always got a big thrill out of just being part of a winning team and not being in an office and working side by side with people and, and that whole notion of locking arms. Uh, it, that's the downside of working remote. Um, but but we're, we're beginning to open up our offices and we're dealing with it and we're going to create a, a, hopefully a pretty amazing work environment in the future. What have been some of your favorite projects at Henderson? Uh, so, you know, probably, so the Eaton Hall, I can see it in your background right there. So the first higher ed project so, um, so Henderson Engineers in 1990 was a 100% Walmart firm. All other, other way. This to your, over your oh, left shoulder. Are we, yeah, yeah, we're flipped around, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, that okay. one. Yeah. So Henderson was a 100% Walmart firm in 1990. And we, we grew, and they're, they've been a great client. We've grown with them across the world. Um, but what we, we made a decision that we wanted to grow and diversify and still do Walmart, but we wanted to grow and diversify. Our first really signature higher ed project that we did was Eaton Hall at KU. So it was exciting because we, here we are doing a really significant higher ed project, but it was at my alma mater. And so that was probably one of my favorite projects. I enjoyed working at Allen Fieldhouse. That was a cool project. Uh, our first national office outside of Lenexa was in Phoenix, and I was uh, involved with getting that started ground up. So that wasn't really a building project, but it was a project of a different type and really enjoyed helping those people build and develop and grow that into one of our largest offices now. So. Very good. Do you feel you should have taken business type courses as you transition from a technical role or somewhere along the way? Uh, transition from a technical role to a leadership role? That is, so this would be my, this would be my advice. Um, I personally, uh, I, I, at Henderson Engineers, I'm not sure getting an MBA would necessarily accelerate your career to another level. Um, there was a point in time in my career where I just, I came in and I did my job and I learned and I grew uh, somewhere along the lines. Uh, I was probably 10 years out of school. I really started researching in uh, uh, just self-improvement and uh, really tapped into uh, leadership and personal growth. And through that, I learned a lot about leadership and how to treat people and what's important in co co company culture. So my, I think my opinion would be uh, maybe sprinkle in a business class here or there. And that's something that you could talk about to kind of differentiate yourself uh, as you go through the interview process. But I would probably wait until you're five or eight years into your career and then maybe take um, some night classes around business to help you. And then certainly if you want to get into the really hardcore business side, and that would be accounting. Um, and number crunching, that's maybe when you approach your company and say, you know what, I have a really passion about the, the business side and the accounting side and the number side and the KPI side. Um, and maybe at that point in time, but I would probably put that off until you know a little bit more about what you really want to do. Um, are there things outside of the class besides business that you would encourage students to do that could help them grow uh, as they're studying for whatever degree they're studying for? Um, there, there are a tremendous amount of opportunities to get involved on campus. And I'm sure a lot of the students have heard that. Get involved, get involved, get involved. Um, you know, whether it's in your dorm or in your fraternity or sorority or whether it's a club that's on campus, those four years or five years that you spend in college are the best years. And there are so many opportunities and things to get involved with. Uh, you know, when I was in school, I probably focused too much on just the X's and O's and my grades. Um, but um, this whole, this whole, and, and I personally, I've changed. I was much more introverted and shy when I was in college. And, um, you know, as you grow up, you kind of learn um, how to prioritize things and what's important. And some of the things that you're worried about, maybe you shouldn't have worried about so much. But this whole notion of 
being comfortable being uncomfortable. That is like a daily mantra for me. And I wish I would have embraced that more when I was in college uh, because I would have, uh, I would have put myself out there more. I would have experienced more and uh, I, w- I would have just been, you know, more, more present and more active on campus than, than I was. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, okay. So how do you handle situations where members of your leadership team have conflicting opinions on the direction of the company or a project and cannot come to a resolution? Hmm. Um, that you'd be surprised how rare that happens. And I think, um, leading by consensus allows people to, so, so this, this is a, I think this is a proven fact. If people are giving, given an avenue to give their opinion, whether they're against it or for it, if they feel that there's a forum that they can express their opinions, they're much more willing to accept the final decision, whether they agree with it or not. I'm not sure that made sense, but if you, if you're a, an alpha leader and you're, you think you have the answers and you dictate what you're going to do, you're going to have more resentment. But if you block out time in a conference room and we're going to, we're going to sit down and spend three hours on this topic and we're going to talk through the pros and cons, the detractors may still be detractors, but they're going to appreciate the fact that some uh, a process was put in place and they were given a, uh, an avenue to be able to talk about their, their perspective and their side. And 99 t- 95 times out of 100, they're going to leave that room supportive of that, even if it didn't go their way. Very good. Um, what is the best way to get a teammate who isn't performing well back on track? Um, there is a, a fantastic book that's called Love Works, and it's written by, I believe his name was Joel Manby. And it's a book about how, and, and, and his use of the word love isn't romantic love. It's, it's I care about you, right? I, if you're an employee, and if, you, if I work with you or for you, or you work for me, I care about you. Um, so if, if somebody is not performing, you need to have, and, th- and this is part of leadership, you need to be willing to have those difficult conversations. And typically when I go into something like that, I think it's called the, uh, there's a name for it, like sandwich technique where you, you start with good, you, uh, in the middle, it's where you need to improve and then you end with something good. So you don't have a meeting with somebody where it's all about how they're, they're, they're not measuring up you know you talk about where they're doing good as well to kind of balance that in but you devote the resources to help this employee if if you have an environment and a culture that you really do care about your employees you devote the resources to try to help them but if it's clear it's not going to work out you have got to make uh, a tough decision and you've got to part ways and you either got to coach that person up or coach them out and ultimately that person will be happier somewhere else but the baggage that that person leaves at a company, if they're not doing carrying their weight, uh, it's really powerful. So if you don't do anything about it, if you don't have those difficult conversations, it can leave some long lasting scars in the culture of your company. Has the way you motivated people, has it had to change with time? Or do you think people are still motivated by the same things as when you started? I think it's changed. Um, and I think, uh, you know, leadership has changed. In my 30 years of career, it's gone from more of a top-down to more of a consensus and group. Um, but, you know, I think what I've seen most that's different in the work is the blurring of uh, uh, work and home. And what I, I don't, what I don't mean is that people are taking their, their work home with them, but just uh, the relationships that they have the friendships that they have, the things that they do, that line is blurred now more than it, than it ever has been. And I think companies that embrace that create an environment or a culture where you want to take care of your friend, right? That person that you're going to uh, the movie with that weekend, you want them to succeed. And it creates that, uh, that, that super chicken culture. Uh, And so you know, I think it was more about being told what to do and you did it. 
back when I first started. And now it's a lot more about, uh, and I've seen the same thing happen at KU. When I was at school, I mean, there was some weed out classes and there weren't a lot of professors that cared about the personal success of individual students. And the sense that I get right now and the data that we talk about and some of the efforts that some of the professors are doing, it's, a, it's completely different, right? And you're finding ways to connect and inspire people and, and, and have them feel fulfilled. And so I think the work environment for me has gone from kind of a task heavy, this is what you're going to do to try to impact people and really uh, change them as, well, that's our whole purpose as a company. Our, our purpose is to create an environment where our employees can reach their full potential. I mean, that's, that's our stated reason that we're in business. It's not to design the Taj Mahal or have the most sustainable building in the world. All that stuff happens as a byproduct of creating an environment where people are motivated and fulfilled and they want to do it because they care about each other. Well, on that note, that, that's great. Uh, we really appreciate you, Rich, coming and spending time with us and sharing your experiences and the, the wisdom that you have. Um, I wish we could applaud, uh, <laughs> but, but it's Zoom. So anyway, uh, we really appreciate you coming and uh, le leading us with a great kickoff to our speaker series. Uh, we look forward to seeing many of you back in two weeks as we have our, our next speaker, and we look forward to that. And, and thanks to the board for helping put all these presentations together.